Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Secret Plus today. I am Trace and this is episode one of three in our new series about nuclear. We're gonna talk about nuclear energy, nuclear power, nuclear reactions, you name it, we're gonna talk about it. So subscribe for all of the episodes in this series. You can also check out an audio version of this podcast on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, you name it, we're there. So today, nuclear reactions. We've talked a lot about nuclear here on the channel, but there's a lot more to think about. Like, for example, who realized that fusion happened in stars? And who discovered things could break and combine at an atomic level? And who figured out that we could create fission with other elements other than uranium? We're talking about the history, the physics, physics metaphors. Yeah, we got those. Astrophysics, so much more, all about nuclear. Oh, this is so cool, but first, where did the idea of nuclear energy come from? Let's kick into it. Nuclear energy is the culmination of hundreds of years of scientific research into the world around us. People were asking, what's this stuff made of? What's this stuff made of? What's this stuff made of? What is inside of this rock, inside of that tree? What is inside of water? What's inside of that human? And why does that thing burn or glow or spark or whatever? For hundreds of years, we inched toward the understanding of atoms that make up everything around us in the entire universe, culminating in the nuclear or atomic age. The atomic age began in 1945, but now that we're more than 70 years in, it doesn't actually feel that nuclear. I mean, does it? Like, do you think, wow, nuclear energy has really changed the world today in like 2018? Nuclear energy promised to revolutionize everything that was around us, everything that we had. You know, we had rockets, we had a push button house that could clean up after everything and a car that definitely flew. We could make the world better by harnessing the power of the atom. But did that actually happen? Like cars, nuclear just never took off, so to speak. When you say nuclear energy, you're probably thinking of uranium. Uh, so I think that's a good place to start. Elements are pretty simple. I mean, by definition, they are the simplest thing that there is. So let's go back to 1938. We know there are atoms, we know there are elements, and you've got them arranged into a table of elements, a periodic table, if you will. And the highest number that we have found in 1938 is element number 92, uranium. Uranium was curious, pun intended. Technically, the Curies Marie and Pierre discovered radium and polonium, but nevertheless, pun superintended. But let's back up a bit. Uranium was discovered by Martin Klaproth in 1789. 1789! That is so long ago. It was named after Uranus and discovered in a mineral called pitchblende. Pitchblende was known since the 15th century. It actually comes out of mining, it's from silver mines in Central Europe, and Klaproth took the pitchblende and isolated little bits of it, thinking that he was actually isolating uranium. He was wrong, sorry, Klaproth. He sounds like a Klingon, doesn't it? Sound like a Klingon? Klaproth! Anyway, doesn't matter. Finally, in the 1930s, all of this uranium research comes to a head. So in 1938, the ballpoint pen was perfected by a newspaper man named Laszlo Biro. And some of the most advanced technology in the world was stuff like radar, which, sidebar, came out of the British government's interest in developing a death ray, something that could kill a sheep 100 yards away. That's why radar got invented. Isn't that crazy? Instead, they found out that they could use it to bounce waves off of planes and see them coming before they could actually see them with their eyeballs. Doesn't matter. These are advanced technologies in the 1930s. A mechanical computer was built called the Z1 in Germany. And in 1938, Enrico Fermi won the Nobel Prize in physics for his work with atomic energy. The most advanced technologies in the world in the 1930s were pens, radar, a computer that was made of gears, and a dude who knew that nuclear physics was gonna be a thing. So in 1935, when Enrico Fermi and others realized that if you bombarded heavy elements like uranium with neutrons, it could make new elements. That was a revelation. It was a huge deal. Chemist Ida Nodak realized it might also split the atoms into lighter ones. It was her theory. Here's how the discovery actually went down. Over the Christmas holidays in 1938, two physicists were going on a walk, Otto Frisch and Lies Meitner. They were analyzing results of an experiment that didn't make any sense to them. Basically, they'd shot a bunch of neutrons at an atom, and they got this weird result. What they thought they were gonna get was heavier elements, but instead, what they got was a couple of lighter elements. What the Nodak is that? 
I actually didn't think of Ida Nodak in her theory of making lighter elements. Her theory was largely ignored at the time. And instead, they went on a walk in the snow to try and figure out exactly what was going on. They thought that the nucleus of this uranium may have split if hit with the neutrons just right. Then the two new nuclei would repel each other at about 200 milli electron volts. They did the math, and it worked out with E equals mc squared, and boom, they sent a paper off to nature, and everyone freaked. Not because Ida Nodak had thought of it first, but because they were like, holy crap, no one has ever thought of this. And Ida's like, hey, guys, I had this there. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is brand new. So let me break down, no pun intended, exactly what happened to this uranium that got all these physicists to freak out. Uranium is a giant atom. 92 protons can have up to 150 neutrons. That's a giant mass of subatomic particles. Think of a proton as one Honda Civic, okay? Hydrogen, one Honda Civic. Helium, two Honda Civics. Uranium is a parking lot full of Honda Civics and a bunch of other cars. If you throw a bunch of cars into the parking lot filled with Honda Civics and other things. You can crash them into each other, breaking the parking lot in half and releasing energy everywhere. Easy to picture, right? Fission means that the atom breaks apart and those parts could go flying off into other parking lots and crashing into them, throwing more Civics into more parking lots and causing mayhem, which sounds awesome. That is nuclear fission. It's breaking stuff apart. And that is what they accidentally figured out in the 1930s. And with that, I think my civics metaphor might be done. <laughs> These nuclear scientists realized that they could use this technology to make new elements, and they did that. They also realized they could use this to create a chain reaction, a fission reaction, to get energy in the form of heat. They could also use this to create a chain reaction that would make a bomb. And the military was like, um, excuse me, yes, hello? And they were like, yeah, energy though, energy, lots of energy. And the military was like, but what did you say at the, the, the next thing? And the, the next thing they did? And that's actually what they did, which was very unfortunate, of course. But back to fission. Fission is one half of the nuclear energy puzzle. Fission is fun, fusion is best. About the same time of the fission conversation, in about the 1920s, British astrophysicist Arthur Eddington published a paper saying that hydrogen was creating helium in stars in nuclear fusion. Shortly thereafter, Hans Bitte or Beth actually described the process of that, but that's neither here nor there. So why fusion and fission? Think of like the biggest thing and the smallest thing. In hydrogen, you've got one proton and one electron. You can't fission that. It doesn't get fissioned. You can't make it smaller. Light elements aren't fissionable because they're too light. According to Dr. Swanson, physicist at the US Naval Observatory, quote, light nuclei require energy to split apart and would release energy only if you confuse them together. Basically, it takes too much work to split the small stuff. So the lightest is hydrogen and it is everywhere. So you smush two hydrogens together really hard at high temperatures and you get them to fuse and then they release energy. But the heaviest naturally occurring fissile material is uranium. Fissile means good at fission. Now there's a difference here that I learned uh, while researching this episode that kind of bent my brain a little bit because there's fissionable and then there's fissile. Some things can do fission. They're not great at it. They are fissionable. They're not fissile. Uranium-238, it is fissionable but requires more energy than uranium-235. Fissile means you get a chain reaction. Civics hitting civics hitting civics. U-233, 235, polonium-239, those are all great. 235 is the atomic weight, by the way. But put simply, it has lots of neutrons, lots and lots of them, and they can break up and create this chain reaction that releases energy. Imagine a collection of 235 red and blue balloons. The blue ones are neutrons, the red ones are protons. They're all tied to one little skinny string. You add some blue balloons to the bunch and it breaks off into two bunches. Also, some balloons pop. That is the energy that is released, is heat. Obviously, we're ignoring the electrons here, it's just a simplification thing, but some might even form smaller little bunches, like two blues and two reds, and that's radiation, and we're gonna talk more about that later, so stay tuned. But if you walk away with one thing from this episode, think of uranium as this big bulky atom. And if you crack it in half, it releases a little bit of energy 
and forms two smaller atoms. Because this is the crux of all nuclear energy that we've created. All nuclear weapons, everything nuclear we've ever sent anywhere, pretty much all of our nuclear technology is based on fission. Because it's so hard to get two little hydrogens to smush together, but it's actually pretty easy to get one giant uranium to break apart. Hopefully this all makes sense. Uh, James Chadwick, an English physicist, was quoted in February of 1932 in the New York Times as saying, quote, I'm afraid neutrons will not be of use to anyone. <laughs> then in 1945, just 20 years later, an American physicist, Henry DeWolf Smythe, wrote, quote, the neutron is practically the theme song of this whole project, talking about nuclear energy and nuclear bombs. My point being, as much as Chadwick and Smythe are way smarter than me, I think we could all now say, Henry was right. Sorry, Chad. The neutron is a big deal, and so is the result of all this work in radiation and fission and energy. Make sure you subscribe and come back next week for more Seeker Plus with special guest Physics Girl. Some elements heavier than uranium are called transuranic. They are created not with lasers, like in Iron Man 2, but by firing neutrons or other elements at the uranium, hoping that they'll stick. Cool, right? I thought so too. Thanks for watching.